like to do is just to um, introduce you to this as well as ourselves and what this uh, thing called clinical care management, uh, the logo of which you see there, and, um, and give you a few words on that before we talk about uh, the actual sepsis care in the emergency department that Dave will lead. So I guess it's, um, you know, how did we get here? Uh, and, and it speaks to where we've come from, that over, over the years a lot of people have been doing a lot of quality improvement work in, in various healthcare sectors, um, not just in emergency medicine. <laughs> and um, I wonder if I can mute. Um, is there a way to mute, uh, Katie? Yeah, I'll hit, um, I'm just going to mute everybody just since there's a lot of um, extraneous noise on the line. And um, I'll just point out that um, if you have a question that um, you want to ask, or you, uh, feel free to interrupt at any time during my presentation or my, my introductory remarks or during David's um, talk, um, there's a hand icon just below all the names. If you've, you've got that panel that says you're under participants, that at the bottom of the names is a hand. And if you um, click on that, that raises your hand and lets us know that you um, you want us to um, or you want to ask a question, and we'll get to you. So um, so. Um, <clears throat> what, one of the things that we're um, interested in talking about is, is how we got from where we were to here. And, and where we were is, for many of us, it began with Evans to Excellence. And, and uh, many of you were involved with that or may have heard of it. Uh, and it was an emergency medicine improvement uh, uh, initiative. And um, many of you um, have worked with this. And each we worked with um, teams from across BC, six health authorities, um, to improve the care of sepsis patients and or improve uh, ED patient flow since about 2007, more so in, in 2008. And, you know, the vision for E2E was to, to um, help um, by, do this by three key components. Um, one is being an improvement collaborative, which involved structured in-person and face-to-face -face and online meetings, uh, an online community where we more organically allowed people to connect and, and to share knowledge and create knowledge. And then finally, an important piece of it was to um, the academic study to evaluate the effectiveness of the work and see if uh, what we're doing made a difference or what, what makes a difference. Um, and so Evidence Excellent was built on a, um, a pretty good re track record. In, in 2008, 2009, we worked with 36 teams on two collaboratives, uh, as I mentioned, ED triage and sepsis. And that morphed into uh, another collaborative in 2010-11, uh, where another 38 teams, or some of them were the same, continued on in these two initiatives, um, and with ED triage morphing into an ED flow uh, collaborative. And we were also successful in, in able to success, uh, secure funds with the uh, help of Kendall Ho in the e Health Strategy Office um, with, from the uh, Canadian Institute of Health uh, Research, the CIHR, to uh, evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the sepsis collaborative. And then, <clears throat> then came along clinical care management. And um, the Ministry of Health has been working on um, clinical care management, or, or CCM, for the past couple of years. And in doing so, looked at, at several international quality improvement uh, programs in creating this, such as Intermountain Health in Utah and, and Yon Shipping in, in Sweden. And a lot of thought and, and went into this, and preparation went into this, and it's just sort of come to fruition this year. Um, CCM is a, uh, is a key strategic priority of the BC Ministry of Health, Innovation and Change Agenda. And the BC Patient Safety and Quality Council, or, or the Council, has a role in supporting the implementation of CCM across the healthcare system. So we're supporting the, the Ministry of Health's initiative. Um, and both Katie, Dave, and I are working with the Council in this work. And E2E is partnering with the Council to support the work of, of CCM. So, you know, and E2E is also partnering in other areas around uh, stroke and TIA, and we'll continue on with, uh, with some of the work on ED flow. So, uh, continue, you know, E2E continues to evolve, and, and CCM is certainly um, where we're at now. The purpose of CCM, uh, their, their vision uh, for the ministry, is to improve the quality of patient care in BC by supporting the implementation of evidence-based clinical best practice by each health authority. And, you know, this serves to, to both harmonize the work that's already being done across the province and, and yet maintain each health authority's ability, uh, their autonomy, and because ultimately the work has to be done by, you know, each of us doing the work. Uh, in, the, in the sites. There are currently nine clinical areas in CCM, 
we are just one of nine areas. And you can see from this list that, that it has a broad spectrum from sepsis, uh, sepsis all the way to uh, surgical site infections and includes heart failure, med, med reconciliation, VTE, and hand hygiene. So it's a, quite a broad swath of, of initiatives going on, and hopefully that will make it easier to, to um, implement by um, spreading the, um, the uh, improvement across multiple sectors and over time bringing those um, into better alignment. So there's actually an opportunity to connect the different healthcare parts, uh, parts of the healthcare sectors. And they're actually, uh, there are a couple that are coming down the pipe um, that are, the ministry is, is working on, um, care for the frail older patients and antimicrobial stewardship. So um, that'll be happening uh, in the next few months. So we see this as a really huge opportunity and we're very excited by this um, and, and, and how much of a difference it has potential to make in, in how we provide care. For, for our point of view, we've never before seen um, uh, such a provincial approach to quality improvement on, on such a large scale. And in doing the work of E2E, it was very clear that we needed the support of, of senior leadership. And this really helps get that commitment from both senior leadership and policymakers across the province. And you know, it's going to create a tremendous economies of scale and uh, help you know, uh, harmonize strategies and reduce redundancies. And so the key to this is that each health authority will decide for themselves how they will implement the changes to improve the care. And the challenge, though, of course, is that we have limited resources to do this. So how do we move forward when there are, are limited resources? And I, I think what this does is hers, it serves to highlight that we are no longer able to continue doing the work the way we were. Um, and are, and that fundamentally both the system and the way we work needs to change, and we can't simply continue to pour more and more money into the system and, and work harder. It's just, it's just not possible. So we need to think differently and to work differently, and, and our approach to this has to shift. So what, what this means ultimately is that this um, it remains, it remains to be seen how, what the answer for this is, but ultimately the answer comes from each and every one of us and, and from all of us uh, working innovatively at our sites and finding out what works best at our site. So well, we think that this is really the beginning of a, of a quality movement and the role of the Quality Council is to accelerate these changes by supporting each health authority in each site. And so in that we're very excited by the potential that CCM has to do this. And it gives us a voice, us as clinicians and, and us as uh, patients. Um, in all of this. So we are really here to help you. Um, it's a Ministry of Health uh, initiative um, being led by the Quality Council and CCM is one focus, focus and, and sepsis is one, is a, one of those areas. So how are we going to be able to focus uh, and help uh, support you in this work? Well, we're going to be doing the, the best evidence and guidelines. I mean, there's new sepsis guidelines, which Dave will talk in a second about that were developed as a result of the CCM work and, and are built upon the least, latest evidence and the care and learnings from E2E. And, and um, these are actually posted on the CCM website. Um, a measurement strategy has sort of been uh, a big focus for us in the last little while. And, and um, clinicians and operational leaders from across all of the health authorities were engaged in the development of indicators for sepsis um, that will help you identify opportunities for, uh, for improvement. Now, collecting the data will be a challenge. We have no... Um, no uh, here, and each health authority will uh, will need to develop their strategies on how they actually collect the data. But we hope that through our um, you know webinars and, and through uh, discussions and networking, we can sort of come to a good way, creative ways to collect the data. Um, there's going to be website resources, a uh, improving sepsis care um, document, which will be up on the website shortly, momentarily. Um, we're going to have a communication strategy involving a community practice, uh, Twitter and Facebook. We're moving in that social movement direction. And, and webinars like this and, uh, and further ones to follow. A couple of other points to make is that um, we're actually putting together a, a conference, an improvement conference in um, March in Vancouver, March 7th to 9th. And we hope to have as part of that um, a pre-conference on the 7th where we look at um, actually uh, improvement techniques um, in the emergency department and probably in the um, acute care setting. Um, and looking at processes around lean and, and so on that will actually be a, a real practical approach to that and we're trying to put that together at this point. And the rest of the conference looks like it's coming together nicely and so, you know, keep your eyes open for this and, and you know, if you're doing stuff that you really think you want to share um, with others and get feedback on, this would be a great opportunity to, um, to you know, to present a poster at this or, or even a, uh, you know, a presentation. So please keep this in mind. It's March 7th to 9th and we'll be talking more about it as time goes on. So, our team, 
I mentioned David Sweet. He's the clinical leader for sepsis. Uh, Katie Proctor is the quality leader for sepsis, and uh, and I'm the clinical director for CCM. So that's really all I had to say. Is there uh, any questions that anybody has? You want to raise your hand, or we can keep your hand. So I just unmuted everybody. Um, if you have a question for Julian, at this point in time, there is a little hand icon just below the participant list. If you click on that, um, you can raise your hand, and I will watch to see if your hand's up to ask any questions. Great. And, and um, I suspect there won't be too many questions at this point. So, Katie, do you mind yep. just handing over the controls to David and, and um, sure. while other people are thinking about any questions they have? Just while the hand is being passed, um, for those of you who have not used WebEx before, um, I'll just go over a couple of things with you. Um, underneath the participant list, uh, as I mentioned, there is the raise the hand. So if you have a question, use that little icon. Right beside it, you'll see a little green uh, check mark. That is, if we ask you questions related to yes and no, that's a quick way to answer yes. And the little red X beside it is a little way to answer no. Um, a couple of icons to the right, you'll see a little emoticon, and at some point in time, you can look in there and you can share how you're feeling, um, or if you're really thrilled by the presentation, you can clap your hands, that type of thing. Um, at the end of this presentation, for after Dave's uh, talk, um, I'm going to be running some polls. So that's just another little way that we can have interactivity in the WebEx. We have some questions that we need to ask of you, and so you'll see some polls come up. Um, and I'll go over that with you when the time comes. Um, this is being recorded so that at some point down the line you want your, your other folks in your emergency department to hear this talk. Uh, it will be recorded and posted on our website probably within a couple of days. Um, and at that point, I will turn the conversation over to Dave Sweet. Excellent. Thank you so much, Katie. And thank you for that great introduction, Julian. Uh, Katie, would you mind just uh, muting the uh, other attendees? So what I was hoping to do today, guys, is um, really go through just a brief introduction on CCM sepsis um, and to introduce to you what's going to be coming in the future. So what I'd like to talk about is, again, to start off and introduce you to the guidelines. There's going to be more talks on this in the next month around the research of the guidelines, and we'll provide you uh, with more detail. Um, a brief introduction to the measures we're going to be looking at for CCM sepsis. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to ask me questions, and then we're going to ask you questions. Um, we'll just sort of where you're at with uh, substance improvement. And then finally, I'll finish off with um, giving you some more information on when our future webinars are, as well as our, our sites. So I always like to start, start my talks off with um, defining um, certain terms you're going to hear throughout this talk and other talks so people don't get com confused. So you're going to hear the terms SERS, sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock. Now, for those not um, involved in sepsis work, uh, SERS is systemic inflammatory response system, and it really means that you have two to far of the following there below the SERS icon. So um, either a higher low temperature, a high heart rate, a higher low white count, or a high respiratory rate. Um, Often in sepsis work, we remove the white blood cell count because we're sort of looking at people at triage and replace it with a change in level of consciousness. So if you have two out of four of those things, uh, we say that you have a systemic inflammatory response. But you can get that with things besides sepsis. You can get it with trauma. You can get it with things like pancreatitis or severe inflammatory uh, diseases. And now you have two out of four of those SIRS, and you have a presumed or confirmed infection, and you have sepsis. Um, so that is the actual definition of sepsis. So it doesn't mean you're prof profoundly unwell. It could mean that you just think you have a strep throat and a fever and a high white count. Uh, sorry, you have a fever and a high white count or a fever and a high heart rate. But the people we really care about are the ones that we call uh, severe sepsis or septic shock. And by definition, severe sepsis is actually when you have sepsis but evidence of at least one organ dysfunction. Um, so a, previously, we used to talk about looking at the renal function, looking at the platelets, um, but due to confusion, many of the sepsis protocols and a lot of the sepsis research around the world, including Rivers' original trial, um, they focus on an elevated lactate being a sign of severe sepsis. And this suggests that um, you have microvascular shock or you have poor oxygen delivery to the tissues or poor utilization, cells are switching into anaerobic metabolism and lactate's being produced. 
The other side of that coin, which can co occur concurrently or separately, um, is septic shock. So this is macrovascular shock or hypotension. And really when we look at the literature, these are the patients we care about. We care about the patients that have the high lactates and the patients that have um, hypotension or uh, septic shock. And this is where the research um, supports that early aggressive interventions have improved mortality benefits. So I don't expect you to read this page. This is um, an example of our sepsis guidelines. Um, these are published on the CCM website. You can download them and look at them in detail. Um, in addition, we have other resources that are on that website, um, being sepsis getting starter kits, uh, sepsis posters, um, examples of our pre-printed orders, as well as our triage uh, screening sheets. And the other reason I put this slide on is I wanted to uh, comment on how much work went into developing these. We had fantastic support. Um, at an international level, we had um, Emmanuel Rivers from the Rivers Trial and Derek Yang is at Pittsburgh um, look over them and help design with us. We had national um, support being the CAPE C4 group, the Canadian Critical Care Committee, um, who have recognized these and approved them nationally. Uh, in addition, additionally, we've had local support um, being the E2E Sepsis Working Group, which has um, been working together since 2007-2008. Um, the Provincial Emergency Department Working Group, as well as the Provincial Critical Care Working Group. And so a lot of work has gone, gone into these recommendations and guidelines. That's just the second page. And really what we've done with these guidelines is what we want to focus on is doing the really simple things that we know of mortality benefit and we want to do them quickly. We tried to stay away from focusing on uh, the more technologically advanced um, sepsis management techniques such as early goal-directed therapy and looking at CVPs and central venous oxygen saturations just so that these can be um, applicable across all emergency departments um, or a vast amount of emergency departments um, that may not have the ability to do those um, technologically advanced things such as place central lines above the diaphragm and look at CVPs. So as you'll see, it's all really the simple stuff done quickly. Or as I like to say, um, the good cheap stuff fast. And you'll notice this across um, all of the guidelines, that it really is the easy things that we do every day, but just identifying these patients and doing them quicker. So these are those sepsis guidelines I had on the previous slide uh, broken down. And I just want to walk um, us through the, the general concepts that we see in those guidelines. Now, um, in about two weeks' time, I'm going to be giving another talk. It's a full-hour talk. Um, on specifically the research um, behind these recommendations and guidelines and the details um, behind these guidelines. So this is just, as I said, just an introduction um, to have you aware of them. So number one, uh, early identification. Uh, questionably the most important part of all of these guidelines is uh, if we don't identify these people, we can't treat them. So what we're asking is that patients that present to the emergency department that have two out of four of the service criteria and a marker of risk and those marker of a risk are generally looks unwell, so anyone who is unwell can be included, um, older than 65, had recent surgery, are immunocompromised, or have a chronic illness. Um, if you have one of those markers of risk, you should be classified as a CTAS-2 and basically be seen within 15 minutes ideally and to have a lactate measure drawn, which we'll talk about number two there. Now, as you can see beside there, we say septic shock, systolic less than 90. So if a triage they're recognized as being hypotensive, they should be a CTAS, made a CTAS-1, um, which uh, suggests they have hemodynamic instability and seen as soon as possible. And then if they have the lactate greater than 4, they remained uh, CTAS-2. So those are the two groups of patients we really want to identify. We move on to number two. So early and repeated lactate measurements. So this is very important as if we don't measure the lactate, we don't know who has severe sepsis. So our recommendations are that we'd like to have a lactate measurement taken within 30 minutes of, rec of um, presentation to triage. Now, in addition to that, there needs to be a rapid lactate turnaround time uh, to have the results back to the clinician within the following 30 minutes. So within an hour of presentation, um, the clinician has the lactate result. Now, in addition to that, one of the other aspects of the guideline is we want to repeat lactate measurements. So if the person um, presents with an elevated lactate greater than four, we'd like to see a repeat lactate measurement in the next two to four hours. 
Uh, the reason for this is there's more and more literature suggesting that patients that do not clear their lactate once it's elevated by at least 10% have a higher mortality and therefore should probably have escalation of therapy. Number three, early cultures. So what we'd like to see for all patients that require IV antibiotics in the emergency department is that they have blood cultures taken before those IV antibiotics. The reason for this are twofold. Uh, one, for the individual patient, so that um, we can narrow their antibiotics and don't expose them to a broader antibiotic for a longer period of time, which would increase the chance of them acquiring um, resistance within their own infection. And two, uh, for societal reasons. So therefore, we don't use more broad spectrum antibiotics in all these patients for an extended period of time and therefore acquire more resistance um, within the province. And secondly, for financial reasons, that we don't use these very expensive broad spectrum antibiotics unnecessarily. Number four, um, early antibiotics. Um, this is one of the two key management issues um, from our four, number five. So for patients that have severe sepsis, septic shock, we like to see them to have their antibiotics within one hour of either their presentation to triage and their hypotension or the lactate result coming back at greater than four. Uh, the literature continues in a retrospective, a prospective, and even randomized trials showing that once you have an elevated lactate or once you have hypotension, that you're on the steep part of the mortality curve and that getting your antibiotics as soon as possible improves mortality. You can see there behind um, where it says less than one hour, uh, less than three hours for admitted patients that get IV antibiotics. Now, this is not going to be a, a, a measured um, variable, but it's a recommendation that patients that are admitted for IV antibiotics would like to see their antibiotics get um, administered within three hours. And this is um, not heavily supported in the literature, um, but just um, on uh, um, best recommendations by experts. Uh, number five, early fluids. So what we'd like to see is that for severe sepsis septic shock that the second liter of crystalloid be initiated within the first hour. Now, the reason it's worded like this is several fold. We know that these patients with severe sepsis septic shock likely in many cases require up to six to 10 liters of mineral resuscitation. Now, it's very difficult um, with the literature currently to um, actually make recommendations on how and how aggressively and how quickly to provide that fluid. But what is accepted is that for the patients with severe sepsis or septic shock, that they getting one liter within the first hour is appropriate and safe. So um, we'd like to, the reason we've worded it is we'd like to see the second liter started within the first hour is um, one, we know that the resuscitation is continuing after the first liter has been given, and two, it helps for documentation and measurement purposes. Um, so we know that the first leader has been ended once the second leader has begun. A brief introduction here to the uh, emergency department measures we're going to have. Um, so right now, all the health authorities as well as individual departments are looking at ways um, to do these measurements. It's, it's, we know that right now it is a barrier and something we're trying to overcome. Um, but what we're looking at doing is looking at the patients with severe sepsis, septic shock, as well as a sampling of patients admitted for IV antibiotics for quality control. Uh, we want to look at the percentage of patients who receive their antibiotics by time goal. We want to look at the percentage of patients who get their blood cultures taken before IV antibiotics initiated. Uh, the percentage of patients who get their second liter of crystal initiated by time goal, as well as um, the percentage of patients that get their appropriate lactate measurements by time goal, not only the initial lactate measurement, but repeated lactate measurements if appropriate, and finally mortality. And the vast majority of um, uh, health authorities are looking at some way of doing a prospective flagging technique, so there's not prospective data collection in the department, and then a retrospective um, data collection um, to look to see if those patients were treated appropriately. So I know that was a whole bunch of information right there, so I just wanted to open it up to the um, the audience and ask if um, there's any questions about what I said this part. <laughs> whoa, whoa. Um, now, I want to, again, comment that um, in about two weeks' time, I'm going to have another lecture going over uh, the, research, um, the research and the way these guidelines were derived. And then in December, there's going to be another talk that Katie and I are doing um, on process matching and measurement and give some suggestions and work through some techniques for measurement of all these variables. Um, so that information is coming. As I said, this is just an introduction. 
um, and to familiarize people with uh, the concept of these webinars. But if there's any questions specifically on what I've said so far, please come forward. Lisa, you have a question? Yes, yeah, actually, uh, Jason Whale here, site chief in Comox. Um, David, great session there. I was just wondering if you had any experience with point of care lactate. The reason I ask is we have our own sepsis protocol up and running here. We experimented with this early on because it seemed to be cheaper to get serial lactates at point of care device and also the ability to get them quickly at triage. We had very mixed success though, despite the company saying that the reliability and the and the uh, the uh, accuracy was there. We didn't find that to be the case. I'm wondering if anybody else has experimented with point of care lactate. So sorry, can you can you say one more time? So you're having difficult there there's lack of accuracy, is that what you said compared to serum results? Yeah, for a trial period, we draw serum lactates and point of care lactates uh, that were capillary lactates essentially on a strip, and we found that there was not good correlation. And I don't know if that was just our technique or if the, if the technology is actually there that point of care lactates should be uh, able to replace our lab. Well, this is something I'm trying to look into right now, and there's many different um, um, there's many different uh, products available for point of care lactate testing. There's capillary point of care lactate testing as well as venous point of care lactate testing. And each of these products have different variabilities and accuracy. Um, I'm hoping to get together a document and sort of um, to give some recommendations around which point of care lactate testing seems to be the most accurate. Um, I know there's been trials looking at the capillary compared to venous, and there has been some issues with um, accuracy with those in the past. But you can always use a venous sample um, in the capillary testing machine. Does anyone else have any experience with the point of care lactate testing machines? Jason, it's uh, Julian. I wondered, what's the name of the point of care test you're using, just, just for information? Do you, do you, you know what you know, I don't know it off the top of my head, but I can email it to you. Great. Just because, I mean, maybe others have better point of care ones that we could look at. Yeah, that would be really helpful. No other Hello. questions right now? Hi there. It's Hazel from Lionsgate. Hey, Hazel. Hi. Um, we just, um, we, I had requested point of care testing in our lab, said that there isn't good quality control. So what they've purchased is a, um, a new blood gas analysis so that on a, in a critically ill patient on whole blood analysis they will do a lactate, which is a faster turnaround time than venous um, in the lab. So yeah, and always remember that. Sorry, Hazel, and always remember that you can do um, um, your VEDA sample, obviously, on the ABG machine still. Yes, you can. It's um, just a, it, it has to be done differently depending on whether it's a syringe sample or a non-syringe sample, but that's another faster way of getting a turnaround time. <laughs> it's more expensive, so they don't encourage it, but it's, um, it's helpful in a resuscitation situation where you can get a lactate within five minutes. Exactly, and actually for these patients we're talking about here, that is the type of machine that you require or a paint of point of care machine so that you do get the turnaround time within that 30 minutes because most serum lactates that you send up that are not based off the AVG um, will not come back in that time frame. Okay, well, so if there's no other questions right now, um, this is the time where we wanted to ask you some questions. So, Katie, if you want to take back um, presenter, and what we're going to do here is just ask you some questions about your department. So we have an idea of where everyone attending this lecture is at, in addition on what we can do for you. So you're going to see a poll pop up um, in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Okay, first poll is up. Can you see it there? Yep. So everyone, you have to click on the A or the B and then hit submit in the bottom right-hand corner. <coughs> And then after we get your answers, we'll actually show the results so that people can see um, what everyone else's answers were. 
looks like there's still just a couple of people left. It's always possible that um, some people have stepped away from the computer as well. So. Yep. And I'll be closing the poll. Results should pop up in about 15 seconds for you. And you should be able to see your results. Wow, fantastic. Cool. Yeah. Excellent. Okay, next question, please. Okay. So the next poll will be around this question. Yeah, pretty much. There's just, there's, looks like maybe one person is still left to go, but maybe as, as you said, they're away. I can close the poll. Everybody's pretty much done. Yeah. It's just taking time to close the poll, and then I'll post the results. questions is um, when you've logged in we actually know um, your site and your center and this will allow us to know um, where the different centers are at and how we can help you in the future so that's one of the reasons for this. For you. There's only two more questions, guys. So. next question is actually a question where you're going to be able to um, write your answer in. And so what we're asking is, what can we really do for you and what would you like, um, what would you like 
uh, for us to do to help you with your sepsis quality improvement initiative. And it can be absolutely anything um, from webinars. I'll make, and in a second here, I'll put a list of possibilities up as well. But I thought I'd just give you a chance here to type your answers um, about what you'd be interested to see from us. You should just be able to type your answer right below the question. <clears throat> so, Katie, could you put the next slide up? Sure. So, these are possibilities um, you can list. So, if, go free to, feel free to list those in your answer if you'd like. Um, so, local site visits from one of our staff to come look at your emergency department, see if we have any suggestions on how to improve. Um, uh, the early sepsis management, different webinars and clinical improvement topics, um, guest speakers on webinars, um, experts in sort of sepsis management or sepsis research, um, an online community of practice where you'll be able to interact with each other and ask questions and see how others overcome barriers that you have, one-on-one um, -on -one phone consultations to discuss your local barriers and see if we can um, help you in that way. There's about 30 seconds left to put in your answers. And then after you've done your writing, just hit submit again. Another 10 seconds, and we'll close the poll. Katie, why don't you close off the audio from all the attendees, um, just to prevent feedback. I'll have to wait until the poll closes. It's blocking me. <clears throat> and the results should be up for you. Next question. Next one. Last poll. So this one is around times. So this is just a question to ask what times are best for you for webinars? Um, we know this is an early morning one. Um, so is this time good for you at 8 to 9 a.m.? Or do you think it would be better to have one that's sort of noon to 1 p.m. or 1 to 2 p.m.? because we're planning on having sort of one to two sepsis webinars a month to help people that are doing quality improvement in this area. I think Katie, once everyone's uh, put their answers, why don't you give me back um, presenter control? Oh, good. Results are up. I guess it's self-selected for the people that are here at eight in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dave, go ahead. Okay, guys, before I just sort of put the final slides up about the future talks and other resources, um, are there any questions right now, any questions at all about absolutely anything, any of the topics we've had um, around what the future holds, anything I can help you with at this time? Nope. Okay, well, and if there's a question that you'd like to ask me um, via email, um, um, feel free to write me anytime. My email is up on the CCM um, website. This is the, the email address to get to the Sepsis CCM website if you want to write it down there. Um, in addition to that, you'll find a list of all the webinars that are going to be happening, um, a page on resources. Um, that contains not the guidelines that we spoke of, sort of sepsis improvement packages, um, getting starter type kits. Um, as I said, sepsis posters, um, examples of uh, the most recent pre-printed orders um, that we've come across, as well as triage identification, screening tools, um, and this lists of, as I said, when the next webinars will be. So right now we currently have these two webinars planned. Um, so on November 24th from, again, 8 to 9 a.m., um, early sepsis management, um, the research behind what we do. Um, and then on December 9th, another one about process mapping that Katie's going to walk us through for your department. 
and then I'll be talking a little bit of improving your measures and techniques for measurement. And if there's any other suggestions on webinars that you'd like to um, talk to, you'd like to hear about, feel free to write me an email, and we'll try our best to accommodate you. And that is it. Thank you so much for attending this morning. And again, this is really just an introduction to CCM so you understand the concept behind it, and as well as a brief introduction to the, um, the guidelines around sepsis and the measures we're going to be looking at, but there's a lot more information to come. <laughs> and so if anyone has any last comments, feel free. Uh, no, Dave, this is Julian. That's very much. It was a great, uh, great presentation. I just want to say that um, you know, we really are, um, we've got, uh, you're, you're really um, trying to open up the idea that um, this will be driven by us, uh, the, by the community, and, and um, I'll, obviously you know what you're doing, but uh, to facil facilitate people who already are doing this work to, um, to uh, embed it better. So thank you very much. Exactly. Thank you, Julian. Okay, thank you, everybody. Talk to you soon. Thank you. Thank you.